un- you followed an un- unusual career path. Uh, how-, how exactly do you get from tailor to auto trader to golfing magnet? <laughs> That's a good question, Kate. Um, I think it's just the way my life and career has developed, really. It was nothing that was planned. Um, in fact, people used to ask me at the, the auto trader, would I ever run a golf course? And I would say, no, I wouldn't, you know, because I didn't want to spoil, I didn't want to spoil a good hobby um, by, by, you know, by turning a hobby into a business. But after saying that, I thoroughly enjoy it and I like the business side of golf as much as I do playing it. So I'm very lucky. But I think it was, I mean, what got me into golf was, was a tax situation. My accountant, after we sold auto trader, um, happened to mention one day that um, that if we bought a golf course, um, just just sort of a general casual chat, then of course there's some massive savings in 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 tax advantages, um, and so I really looked at that, and I was a very very much aware that there was a golf course on the market that I liked called Sanford Springs, and um, and that was on the market for sale, and so Jennifer and I went and had a look at it. And what we found was we actually liked it, and it was a business that we could do together. For me, looking after the actual business side and the golf course side, and Jennifer would look after the internal side. And I was too young to retire, really. You know, I felt I was too young to retire. In fact, I still do think I'm too young to retire. <laughs> um, so that was the transition from auto trader, really, to golf. Um, when I was a young man, um, when I left school, I actually, the career officer came round and sat in front of me, or I sat in front of him rather, and he said, right, what would you like to do? And I said to him, actually, I'd really like to be either a tailor or a chef. And um, no, he said, you don't want to do either of those. <laughs> he said, chefing is going out of the window and it's all going to be mass produced sort of food and packet food and everything. That's the future. So it means you've got to go and work in a factory packing food, which I'm sure you won't want to do. And, and tailoring's dying out and it's all machine made now. Um, and that's just a factory sort of machining job. He said, and you weren't like that either. Why don't you go and get a job in, in the high street selling men's fashion? So that's what I did. Have I lost you? No, no, no. I'm here. Sorry, I'm keeping I'm keeping quiet when you're speaking, although I'm nodding furiously, but you can't see me because <laughs> uh, I, I obviously don't don't want my voice to interfere. That yeah. when I speak, it kind of no, the connection cuts out a little bit. That's fine, Kate. It's um my screen had gone blank. That's all, and I just wondered whether I whether I. All right. Yeah. It, no. So I I um I was only fifteen. You know, I'm one of nine children, and um, if you can imagine, that was straight after the war. Um, and, uh, you know, I was straight out of work at 15. I didn't have a chance. I don't even think I may have been bright enough in those days to actually have gone to university. And if I did, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. Um, but, you know, I mean, at 15, I was working. So there was no, there was, you know, I think I had two weeks off school. You know, I finished in July the 7th, whatever the term ends. And something like the 20th, I was at work. And I was working for a company called Burton's The Tailors. And they did made to measure and they did off the peg stuff. And it was quite good because I enjoyed I enjoyed I enjoyed the atmosphere and there was an opportunity to learn about tailoring, which was good. Um, but but I began to learn how there was a skill in communicating with people. And by communicating with people, how you could actually sell something. And, um, and, you know, I think I was only 15, 16. And I started asking particular questions when, when I was with a customer. They didn't let me loose with a customer until I'd been there about four or five months. You know, I was cleaning everything. I'd piles of... Um, racks of uh, materials all the way down both sides of the shop so I used to have to keep those clean and the brasses clean and stuff like that so it was about four to six months before I actually was allowed to be let loose on a customer and what I did was that you know by communicating with these people I could actually begin to understand what they wanted and then and then find the right 
garment for them. And I used to talk to the wives as well and, and get their opinion. And so, you know, I began to like the idea of selling. And I think that's where I started going wrong, going right rather. And then I started to read books on selling. And there were some very interesting books on the market. Dale Carnegie was one of them, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And, and that book still sort of sticks in my mind quite a lot. And so I decided from that point that really what I wanted to do then was to learn to be a salesman and, and see how good I could become at it. And I looked at, there were several companies on the market. If you, you, we're going back to the 60s now when selling was really, really becoming a bit of a, an art and that companies were taking it very seriously that actually if you had the right salesman in the right teams, you could actually achieve quite a lot. A bit like the Ryder Cup over the weekend, you've got the right guys in the right team and it's amazing what you can achieve. And there were three companies in particular that, that I highlighted. One was Thompson Regional Newspapers, one, believe it or not, was KP Nuts, and the other one was Green Shield Stamps. Um, and they all offered sales training for their sales reps. And I was actually offered a job with all three, and you think I was only 20, and I was offered a job with all three of them with a company car that was fully paid for, no taxes, um, uh, which was an amazing perk. And, um, and I took the evening post job because uh, in Reading um, because their sales training was a little bit more in-depth than everybody else's. And I really soaked that sales training up for about five years um, as far as becoming a salesman was concerned. In fact, I was top salesman with Thompson Regional Newspapers. And, that's, um, and that covers all the newspapers that Thompson owned throughout the UK, which must have been at least 20 titles. And I was top salesman there in the group um, for about three years on the trot. Um, be, and I loved selling. And, I, and it really was a great art um, because it's all about communicating with people. And then um, I took on their sales management roles as far as training was concerned. They sent me off on all these other, these other management training um, courses, which I did and enjoyed. Um, but then uh, I decided that it was time really for me to go out and see what else I could achieve with my life. And John Modeski, my um, partner in Auto Trader, worked with me at the Evening Post in Reading. And we quite often would meet up and talk about our own businesses, what we would do, how would we go about it. We actually decided that maybe it would be a nice opportunity to do something together. And one day, uh, John went off to California for a holiday and he came back with a very, very basic idea of people selling cars with a photograph and we just developed that idea and it took us about two years to launch it being the first issue came out on the 10th of February 1977 and um, the rest really is history but you know we sold that we sold Auto Trader from a piece of paper with with sketches on I mean it's quite amazing when you think about it can you give me an idea of the numbers and the turnaround, you know, just to sort of inspire people where, from that first issue in 1977 to when you actually then moved on from Auto Trader? How long did that take and, and how much did they buy it for? Well, the first issue was sold for 10p. Uh, 10p a copy. But you see, we, we launched Auto Trader and it cost 10p an issue. And we, we sold in the first few weeks, two or three thousand, that's all it was, two or three thousand a week. But what we but but what we learned from that, you think two or three thousand, that's nothing, you know. And it scared the hell out of us because it wasn't a lot. But what we did realise was we had two or three thousand people buying that publication because they were interested in a car. Now that's big. And when you looked at the evening post in Reading that uh, we were working for, that sold at the time 54,000 copies a day. But the majority of people buy a newspaper for its news content. And I think at the end of the, uh, end of the day, there was about, I think the research, and it's not my research, it was Thompson's research, I think there was about 
three or four thousand people a week buying the Reading Evening Post because so we from the first issue we were up with them but they didn't realize that um, they saw their publication with a 54,000 sale copy and ours was only two or three thousand a week but within a very short period of time we were selling to the same amount of people and the pictures captured people's imagination now that I mean, uh, 1977 Auto Trader went on to really be one of the, the most iconic um, print publications, uh, you know, in, in the history of this country. I think in many ways. Do you think? How do you think your business model would have changed if the internet, as it is today, would have been around back then? W- would you have been able to find the same niche, or you know, how has the internet changed the topography? Do you think of that business? Because now everybody expects pictures and, you know, rotating models. and. <laughs> of it. Could have we launched it? That's a really big question. Because, you see, what we did is that we focused all our marketing around the news agent. Because what that was, was that you know, most people went into a newspaper, the news agents, most days to buy a newspaper. So we had, uh, we were actually Thames Valley Trader at the time, that was our original name. And, and we had posters outside news agents. We, we, had, we had names above the, above the news agent stores, Thames Valley Trader, and inside. So we spent quite a lot of money promoting ourselves around the news agents. And then inside, we would, we would um, obviously have the publication for sale. Now, the interesting thing is that then you could do something about your competition, which is good and bad, because it would, I mean, in, in later days, if, if somebody tried to launch a publication against Trader through the news agents, we knew exactly what to do, and we were quite good at, at, at taking, no matter how big or small it was, we took all competition very, very seriously, and we took it on um, head to head. And we won because we did take it seriously. And the question I'd ask myself is, if we were doing that now, we couldn't we couldn't take them on in the news agents because they would be on the net. And you cannot really compete with a company on the internet unless you. It's really quite difficult to explain, but you have so much techie stuff working for you and you've you've really got to be the most popular click um, than your your competition now if you're smart enough and you've got the right techie boys with you and they're not expensive you can you can take on the real big boys you know in in a head-to-head competition because you need the words within in the first strap line to get you on the same page as they are and once you can get on the same page as your competition, most people will will view two or three or four or five of the companies. When you when you Google something, your you, your first page on on Google will have the the top boys, and then um, I say uh, the others below it. So you can be right in amongst the serious competition. If your product's good enough, then you can then you can compete with them. Um, so it's, it's, I've probably gone around in circles and you can think, well, he actually hasn't said anything here, but I think it's, diff- I think it's very difficult. I think, I think there's massive advantages to starting a business today the way we are actually starting our last minute tea time um, because you can, you, can, you can do it and you can get directly to the marketplace economically, whereas without the internet you can't do that. I think um, somebody once said to me, 50% of the money I spend on advertising is wasted, and I wish I knew which 50% that was, which is very true. It always has been true. But I think I think if you spend your money wise enough and clever enough on the internet, you can increase that 50%, whereas you won't by using traditional media. Brilliant. No, I, I think I get what you're saying. That it's, it's sort of in in some ways it's it's made the playing field a lot bigger. Yep. But it's made it more level. Very level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very level. You think with our um, leaderboard last minute tea times, um, last minute golf. I do beg your pardon. Which is a product we launched 
uh, about four weeks ago. We're up there with the big boys, you know, and we're competing for the same people, and and we're we're developing a business and and creating a business for golf course operators, and I think it's brilliant, you know, and and we're doing it mostly, believe it or not, uh, for the for the golf courses. Um, you think? Can you give me an elevator pitch on that? Because uh, do people people may not have heard of that. What is what is the latest venture? The, this last minute tea times. Yeah, it's um, it's called leaderboardlastminutegolf.com, and uh, and the way it came about was that we had we had an issue the fact that there are these companies um, dot com companies that advertise last minute or late tea times. On the web, they get the golf courses to sign up, and they encourage at times they encourage um, golf courses to discount, and then they take somewhere between twenty and thirty percent commission for every tea time they sell. Now, I personally don't think that's right. I think it's just killing the industry. I'm not knocking the dot com companies. I think. The more companies make a profit, the better. And I think profit is a very, very good word and a very healthy word. And I'm not knocking them, and I think it's very enterprising what they do. From a golf course operation point of view, it's not good and it's not healthy. You think that you, the golf courses are discounting their, their green fees, they're then giving big commissions away. They've got nothing left to invest in the product and to maintain the product to a high standard or an acceptable standard. So... I wanted to try and find the antidote because at the end of the day, we use these dot-com companies as well. And um, as a group of, of general managers, we were sitting around discussing it one day at one of our meetings. What is the antidote to this? How can we stop paying these big commissions? And we, we decided in the end, well, why don't we do our own? Which is exactly where you're coming from. So we created... Um, leaderboard, lastminutegolf.com, and it was for late tea times, for tea times that we weren't going to be selling as of Sunday onwards for the next eight days. And we all put our tea times on to our website, and it worked, uh, which is amazing, and it was almost immediate. But but then we were ha- we were quite happy with that. You know, we you know we can save an awful lot of money. Um, uh, and and recoup the um, recoup the uh, the investment that we've made just by not spending out on these large commissions. And more and more golf courses were saying exactly the same as what we've been saying. So I said, well, why don't we just open it up to everybody? Which is what we've done. And instead of paying a commission of twenty or thirty percent, you know, I took it right back to the trade days, and it's six pounds a week. Now, a golf course can have a full page on leaderboard last minute goal where he's got all his golf club details, picture of his golf club, his logo, everything, advertisement space so he can say, sale in the pro shop this week, say 50% or whatever, and all tea times for the next seven days. In addition to that, he has a unique number. He can go into that page of his any time, day or night, and change his copy. Now he can put his normal tea times in there. He can put, he can discount his tea times or whatever. But the idea is to get control of these discounted tea times and to help the industry grow again into a, into a, a, a developing industry. I mean, we've got the Olympics coming up. You know, we have to develop all all our all our young golfers into gearing. I mean, it's an Olympian sport, golf now. You know, and we have to make sure that. We have people coming through to be able to, to, um, to develop those skills. And so it's important that these golf clubs have the money to reinvest in the product. And so from 30, 20 or 30% commission, what these guys are paying, they're paying us just £6 a week as of February 2013. And it's free for them to use until then, completely free of charge. They can put. They can do exactly what I've said, and they have that full page running, 24 hours a day, selling tea times free of charge. Now, Brilliant! It's kind of a no-brainer, isn't it, when they've been paying 20 to 30 percent of their of their costs <laughs> uh, up until then? It sounds a bit like sort of you. You kind of 
reinvented Facebook, but for golf clubs, right? Yeah, I, we're well on our way to doing it. That's right, and we've got a lot more, lot more going on that as well. And we, we've got this swing analyzer that's that I think is bringing. I think this is very unique, and it's bringing the golfer and the internet together in in a very unique way. The fact that. Um, do you want me to talk about this now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to give us a quick rundown because that I had a look at that the other day, and I was going to ask you. You've, you've, you know, you've employed this very high-end technology, creating this Swing Reader app, which um, you know allows people to film their golf swing from two directions, and then it will go away to your team and be analysed for, for feedback. Now that seems like it, it, it's a, it's a free service at the moment. It seems like quite an involved process from your point of view what what's the thinking behind offering that service to your to, to golfers well i think it's it's very unique and it is very clever and i'm very very enthusiastic about it the idea is to bring golf closer that's the idea of it and the you know i want um, we are developing leaderboard as a brand and and although we own some very nice golf courses we we need to be a brand on our own outside of golf course ownership but what this swing analyzer is destined to do is and it's amazing you you need to you know educate people even though it's free you still have to educate people and they have to begin to trust you to be able to use it but basically what it is yeah you you film you the only way you can get this app is to download it through our website leaderboardgolf.co.uk you and uh, the front page comes up and the app's there on the right and you just click on that and it's all the information and there's a video on that page explaining how it works and what you need to do so it's not just type you know sometimes reading copy is a bit is a bit misleading and so this is this is actual video telling you how to use this app and then when you when you when you downloaded it obviously and you videoed your golf swing you then send it back to us. And this is where you get the personal touch with, with the internet. And I think it is very clever. One of our professional golfers will then make contact with you but by way of email, just saying, you know, um, hi, Kate, you know, we've had a look at your swing. Um, and this is w what we feel you will need to do to improve your golf swing. And the, um, if you need to need any more advice or opinions, please make contact with me. Um, and I'd be, be pleased to give it to you. Uh, wanna put, uh, we'll also ask permission to put it up on our YouTube channel, which we have um, part of our main website. And I think that would be an interesting thing because the general public will be able to see these golf swings, feel confident that there's no skullduggery going on, and then, of course, be more inclined to use it themselves. Now, this is stage one. So the idea is as far as this is a leaderboard thing, right? Now, as it develops, I want to send those emails out to all the other golf courses that are advertising with us on our websites. So, you know, if a guy in Manchester um, has an issue, he, he will send it to us. And then we will immediately um, email or text the nearest golf club to him is with us and saying, do you want to do you want to make a comment to this? This guy in Manchester is only 10 miles away from you and he might just want to come and see. Golf lesson. That's the objective. Brilliant. No, it's a really, really good idea and a, a nice use of technology as well. Um, OK, well, let's. Move on. That you famously, I mean, you mentioned it before. Uh, you took good advantage of tax relief options uh, for entrepreneurs when you were moving into the golf uh, business for yourself. Back then, you know, you said it was by word of mouth. Someone said, "Oh, there's this great deal that you can, you know, you can do with tax at the moment." Today, a lot of that information is available on the web. You know, do do you? Uh, because there seems to be an awful lot of drive and, you know, sort of initiatives by government and also, you know, big blue chip companies to try and help and foster the sort of the startup culture, particularly in the UK through through these tough economic times. Would you say from experience that it's worth really having a good dig around to see what tax breaks and what kind of, uh, you know, help is out there financially at the moment? 
Oh yeah, I'm, yeah, absolutely, Kate. You know, I think that's I think that's got to be priority number one. Is if you're thinking of, of creating a business, then then you owe it to yourself to see what there is available in the way of help from from governments as far as grants and and tax breaks and all sorts of things is available. Yeah, you definitely need to do that. And I think the internet is a great way to find that out. Or go and talk to your, your accountant because he'll know as well. Or he should do. Yeah, otherwise you should be looking for a new accountant. <laughs> um, okay, more of a general question now about the internet. Do, do, what do you think is important for small businesses to understand or realise about the internet today, either from the positive or from the negative, you know, because there are, there are downsides as well to, to being online? Yeah, I think I, the internet is a developing product and it will continue to develop and it will continue to change and I think in five or ten years time it will be completely different to what it is today and you you go back in time and I mean we had something with the yellow pages which is which was about a two inch thick publication full of full of businesses um, and how they operated well that virtually doesn't exist anymore I'm sure there's a small edition somewhere but very small so that's all moved into the internet and um, and the internet will continue to change. You have to embrace it. I don't think anybody's got an option. I think you have to embrace the internet. I think it's a fantastically economical way of getting your story over. Um, but you do have to be careful. Of course you do. You know, you, you, I think you have to pick your wording right. I, um, I mean, you know, we're changing a couple of things with our sites because we realize that the strap and the, the wording is, is wrong. Um, because it's not it's not getting the, the clicks it should be, so so you need to make sure the 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 web address is absolutely spot on to get into the marketplace and get as many hits on it as possible. That's priority. Um, you have to embrace it. You have to develop with it. You know, I've always said that you know it's not just businesses and, and it's people as well that that some. At a point in time is very, very good for the business. But unless he grows and develops with that business, he will get left behind. And that's the time he's got to leave and go and find another job. And it's the same with businesses. Unless you grow and develop and move with the times, you will get left behind. And when you get left behind, you go out of business. And presumably as well, the you know, the analytics that are available, you know, you said yourself there that, um, you know, you can look at headlines and they're not getting the results. But presumably the analytics, the way that you can actually track people's appreciation by where they're clicking on a page is massively useful. Now, you, you couldn't see an auto trader 1970s. You couldn't see what people liked, could you? You had to make a, a judgment or, or run a survey of some description. Oh, you do. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And how would trader be in 1977 if we had had the web? Would we not have gone for a printed issue? Would have we just gone on the web? I mean, that's a big question. Um, so it's it's completely you know it's completely different. But you have to. There's no question. If you don't embrace the web and do it right, you're going to get left behind. <laughs> 